mentioned Merleau Ponty. I think with regard to to Dreyfus's views, and maybe with regard to reflection as well. Yeah. But you also you mention him in the book, and you also mention Husserl, so a number of phenomenologists. And as I mentioned, I think at the outset of the of our conversation, you work mainly at least, and you should correct me though, if, if you see things differently in the analytic tradition for the philosophy of mind. So it's surprising to me because you don't often see Husserl and Merleau-Ponty uh, cited in works of analytic philosophy, why they are so relevant to your work in the philosophy of art here in the entanglement. Um, There's so many different ways to answer that. Um, I don't think that um, anybody has thought more carefully and deeply about consciousness in the 20th century than Husserl and Merleau-Ponty. Very interesting. Um, And if analytic philosophers haven't read them, well, shame on them. (laughs) You know, that's, that's just not... There are different traditions. When I when I teach Melo Ponti, I, I usually uh, at the beginning of the class come with a huge stack of books, all the sort of giants about thought and perception, philosophy of mind of of the twentieth century since the Second World War. You know, I've got Davidson and Evans and Anscombe and Wittgenstein and Melo Ponti and actually, excuse me, not Melo Ponti. Uh, Ryle and Dennett and Chomsky and you name them, I've got them all there. And the striking thing about all of these books is that they don't refer to Merleau-Ponty, um, even the ones written after his work was translated into English. Um, and that's a, that's a really striking omission. I mean, in the in the in the English philosophical tradition, I can only think of three writers or two writers really very early on corrected that. Um, one was um, Charles Taylor and the other was Hubert Dreyfus. And they both referred to Merleau-Ponty. T- Taylor because he was educated in Canada with a very strong Francophone tradition um, and Dreyfus because he was primarily a, one of the few analytic philosophers to be a phenomenologist. Um, I think that um, the uh, the um, it's a kind of a weird feature of British and American intellectual life that we've tended to ignore these other traditions. I mean, obviously, there's, there's explanations we can give, perhaps having to do with the Second World War and the migration histories and the different cultural divisions that, that happened in our world as a result of the war. But um, but I would say that any any philosopher interested in perception should read Merleau-Ponty um, and increasingly will be reading Merleau-Ponty as compared to when I was a student. But why why do you think more particularly, what is it about Merleau-Ponty's approach to consciousness and perception that would preclude his being cited by the Dennett's the Riles, the Chalmers, the the people. Well, you didn't actually mention um, Chalmers, but Chalmers, the people in the in this big stack of books. Yeah, I don't think you'll find Merleau-Ponty in, in the index to Chalmers, to Chalmers, uh, the conscious mind. Um, uh, because there's something that you really value about the approach that other analytic philosophers haven't always or haven't always uh, found. Yeah. You know, I don't know whether I don't know whether the answer to this question is deep or superficial, like whether it's just a sort of a sociological fact that we we read who our teachers told us to read and and it was our teachers who sort of taught us what the problems were that we have. Um, from the beginning of my work as a young philosopher of mind, focusing on perception, I was engaged with the ways in which it seemed to me we were under describing the phenomena that interest us, that we didn't have the vocabulary to do it justice, that we weren't, that we were working with car- cartoon examples and sim- very simple minded 
um, ways of sampling our experiential lives and talking about them. Um, this is this is something that Merleau-Ponty actually thematizes. He explores the ways in which we um, the way in which prejudice essentially shapes the way we think about our own experiential lives. You know, we know that there's there's two glasses and a book on the table in front of me, and I see the two glasses and the book, so we assume that the, the, you know that my experience is a kind of a representation of two glasses and a book, and we stop there. But there's so much more to be said about what I'm seeing and the as aspects of my perception, its affective or conceptual or emotional side that are not touched on by two glasses and a book. Um, and um, so there, there are ways in which, in which, you know, for example, one of a quote from Miller Ponty that, in a way, could serve as my as my um, my motto is Miller Ponty says, "There's nothing harder than knowing what you see." And that's that's an idea that I would suggest that most analytic philosophers would not agree with. <laughs> it's, there's nothing easier than knowing what you see. You know, I'm looking at mm -hmm. the cup. The cup is what I see. End of story. Um, uh, so a lot of the work that Merleau-Ponty does is to invite us to discover the indeterminacy or multi-determinacy of our perceptual experience. Um, there are some analytic philosophers who I think came upon very similar ideas. I actually think that Anscom, working very much in the spirit of Wittgenstein, um, came to appreciate ways in which there was a kind of irreducible indeterminacy in our perceptual lives that, uh, that we don't do justice to when we suppose that, you know, we see objects. Just the word object then becomes a placeholder for many different kinds of things that we can see. Um, And yet, finally, it, it may just be that these are very difficult writers, um, and they haven't belonged to our curriculum, so we don't read them. Hmm. Well, I don't think that that was superficial at all, yeah. <laughs> actually. No, what, I meant by, um, what I meant by superficial was that it could just simply be our parochialism as a community, that you, mm -hmm. we only read things in English. So Merleau-Ponty's Phenomenology of Perception, which is his most important book, was published in 1945 in French. It wasn't translated into English until 1961 or 64 or something like that. It wasn't translated particularly well. Um, students in Oxford and Cambridge, England and Cambridge, Massachusetts didn't really feel they needed to pay attention to what was going on in Europe. They were, they were satisfied with their own, own approaches growing out of the reception of, of the whole positivist tradition and um, how that shaped the way we thought about language of perception in Britain and the United States. So that stuff is just neglected. But we're way too late in human history to neglect it anymore. So that's, that's, that's my view. So I encourage all of my students to familiarize themselves with that work. Where did Husserl, though, enter into the entanglement? Um, so throughout the book, I, I discuss Husserl in connection with a number of different ideas. Husserl is a, is a main source for some of my thinking about the concept of style. Um, but he's also a main inspiration for me for thinking about the nature of philosophy itself. Um, Husserl very often used the term reorientation to describe um, what philosophical research lets us achieve. It lets us reorient ourselves in relation to our own lives. Um, and we do work in philosophy to achieve those kinds of reorientations. Um, so we we have an everyday, we have a sort of a, 
a set of beliefs about the way the world around us is built up and made. But through philosophical reflection, we can try to look at that world and look at our beliefs and attitudes about the world in different ways. And for me, that reorientation is an interesting example of what I'm calling reorganization, um, and which I associate with the aesthetic. Um, by reorienting ourselves, what we're doing is we're cultivating resources for seeing what is there in new ways, for thinking about what is there before us in new ways, for seeing into things differently, for seeing what we couldn't see before. Now, I'm coming to the entanglement because Husserl also had this beautiful idea that philosophy is something we do vocationally. So just like you might you might serve as an umpire on your kid's Little League team or in a Little League game. And when you do that, you put on the umpire's hat and you become an impartial judge of who's safe and who's out and of what's going on in the game. And you stop. You, you're not functioning as your kid's dad. You're functioning as the, the umpire. Right. But then at the end of the day, you take your hat off and you go back to being partial to your kid. You go back to your, to your um, everyday life as a dad. So what's interesting, though, is that when you, when you, in philosophy or through engagement with art, make these kinds of reorientations, and then at the end of the day, go back to your everyday life, your everyday life has been altered because you now know that reorientation is a possibility, that the ways mm -hmm. in which you're different. So that gets wrapped up in your everyday. It gets entangled, in other words. Yeah. So there's a way in yeah. which... Husserl's picture, as I understand it, helps us appreciate one of the ways in which philosophy and life are entangled. Once you've, yes. once you've, like, once you've followed the philosophical train of thought, like once you've followed the cogito or whatever it might be, you can never regain the innocence you had before. A very interesting theme in in Husserl, which is a, I realize a very like a, it's a central topic that runs through my book the entanglement, has to do with the idea of the naive. You know, philosophy is always trying and has always been trying to sort of recover what ordinary people think about things, what, what we naively think, so that we can understand what we ought to think, um, whether it's Socrates interrogating his interlocutors about what they take courage or piety to be, or whether it's ordinary language or ordinary language philosophers urging us to reflect on how we use words so that we can try to have a philosophically unbiased picture of what our conceptual schemes are. Philosophy is, is always kind of in the quest for what the sort of ordinary person on the street would say about perception. What is the naive view? What is the natural attitude? And, and an idea that you find in Husserl, I think, by the way, I don't consider myself a Husserl expert at all. I just, um, uh, I studied the, the Crisis of the European Sciences, which was his last book quite closely, but I don't consider myself overall an expert on Husserl. But, but an idea that he offers is that um, thanks to the Well, is, is, the, is roughly the idea that we're not as naive as we think we are. Because, after all, we have a cultural history in which ideas get sedimented, is, that's a term he uses, in our lives, whether it's writing practices or mathematical practices or scientific practices, so that our, our, our ordinary life is in part shaped and organized by these, these fruits of, of science or culture. And that's also an example of, of what I would call entanglement.